In one of my recent videos, I covered the life of the craziest king of England, Henry VI, whose reign was filled with turmoil, rebellion, and civil war, worsened by his mental illness. In this video, I'm going to be covering a king who was the exact opposite of Henry VI, and is often regarded as one of the, if not the greatest warrior king in England's history, who just so happened to be that crazy king's father, Henry V. Henry V was born in the tower above the gatehouse of Monmouth Castle in Wales, and for that reason he was sometimes referred to as Henry of Monmouth. He was the son of yet another Henry, known as Henry Bolingbroke, who later became Henry IV of England. At the time of his birth, his father's cousin Richard II was the reigning English monarch, while his own grandfather was the influential John of Gaunt, a son of the late King Edward III. As he was not very close to the line of succession, his date of birth was not officially documented, but it is now generally accepted that he was born on the 16th of September 1386. After Henry's father was exiled in 1398 due to a disagreement with a fellow duke, the young Henry accompanied Richard to Ireland. While in the royal service, he visited Trim Castle in County Meath, the ancient meeting place of the Parliament of Ireland. In 1399, when Henry was just 13 years old, his grandfather, John of Gaunt, died. And in that same year, King Richard II was overthrown by the Lancastrian usurpation that brought Henry's father to the throne. Upon his father's anointment as king, the young Henry was recalled from Ireland and named heir apparent to the Kingdom of England. He was created Prince of Wales at his father's coronation as a symbol of this new position, and the Duke of Lancaster on the 10th of November 1399, making him the third person to hold the title that year. His other titles were Duke of Cornwall, Earl of Chester, and Duke of Aquitaine in France. During this same year, it appears Henry spent time at the Queen's College under the care of his uncle Henry Beaufort. After his time at the college, he began carrying out the duties of High Sheriff of Cornwall, Less than three years later, Henry was in command of part of the English forces during a military campaign in Wales against Owain Glyndwr, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, before joining his forces with that of his father to fight Henry Hotspur Percy, who was actually the namesake for the Tottenham Soccer Club, at the Battle of Shrewsbury in 1403. It was there that the now 16-year-old prince was almost killed by an arrow that became impaled on the left side of his face. An ordinary soldier might have died from such a severe wound, but Henry had the benefit of the best possible care given his royal status. Over a period of several days, John Bradmore, the royal physician, treated the wound with honey to act as an antiseptic, crafted a tool to screw into the embedded arrowhead known as a bodkin point, and thus extract it from the young prince's head without doing further damage, before flushing the wound out with alcohol. The operation was a resounding success, but left Henry with permanent scars on the left side of his face, evidence of his past experience in battle. After his recovery, the young prince returned to the Welsh revolt of Owain Glyndwr, which absorbed his energies until 1408. Then, as a result of the king's ill health, Henry became more active in the politics of the nation. From January 1410, helped by his uncles Henry and Thomas Beaufort, legitimised sons of his grandfather, the prince basically had full control over the government. Both in foreign and domestic policy, it was soon made clear that his views differed greatly from that of his father's. Henry would be discharged from the council by his father in November 1411. While this may have created some rift in their relationship, it seems this quarrel was solely political. Though it is probable that the Beauforts had discussed the abdication of his father, their opponents certainly strived to defame Prince Henry. This defamation is likely the cause of Henry commonly being portrayed as being a rebellious youth, as shown in the movie King, which I do highly recommend, it's a really good movie. While he is commonly portrayed that way, and was immortalised that way by Shakespeare, it seems highly unlikely he was actually like that, as shown by his involvement in war and politics during his youth. Prince Henry's father, Henry IV, and yes, I know it is quite confusing, as they're all named Bloody Henry, finally died on the 20th of March, 1413, and our Henry, Henry V, succeeded him and was crowned on the 9th of April, 1413, at Westminster Abbey. The ceremony was marked by a terrible snowstorm, 
but the common people were undecided as to whether it was a good or bad omen. At the time of his coronation, Henry was described as having been very tall, at around 6 foot 3, slim, with dark hair cropped in a ring above the ears, and clean shaven. His complexion was ruddy, the face lean with a prominent and pointed nose, and depending on his mood, his eyes were said to flash from the mildness of a dove's to the brilliance of a lion's. During the initial part of his reign, Henry tackled all of the domestic policies together and gradually built on them a wider policy. From the first, he made it clear that he would rule England as the head of a united nation. He let past differences be forgotten and honourably reinterred the late Richard II, his father's predecessor. The young Edmund Mortier, 5th Earl of March, was also taken into favour and the heirs of those who had suffered who had suffered under the last reign, were gradually restored to their titles and estates. In saying this though, Henry was certainly no pushover, and when he saw a grave domestic danger, he acted firmly and ruthlessly, such as the case of the Lollard discontent in January 1414, which included the execution of Henry's old friend, Sir John Oldcastle, in 1417, by burning in order to nip the movement in the bud and make his own position as ruler secure. Henry's reign was generally free from any serious trouble at home, with the only exception being the Southampton plot in favour of Mortimer, which involved Henry Baron Scope and Richard, Earl of Cambridge, in July 1415. Mortimer himself, despite being central to the plot, remained loyal to the king, however, and this plot was swiftly put to rest. Starting in August 1417, Henry promoted the use of the English language in government over French, which had been used since the Norman invasion in 1066 up until that point. His reign marks the appearance of Chancery Standard English as well as the adoption of English as the language of record within government. He was also the first king to use English in his personal discussions since the Norman conquest 350 years earlier. After those minor domestic inconveniences stated earlier, Henry was free to turn his attention to foreign affairs, which ultimately led him to what he is probably most known for today, being his incredibly successful military campaign in France. Old commercial disputes and the support the French had lent to Owain Glyndwer were used as an excuse for the war, while the disordered state of France offered no security for peace. The current King of France, Charles VI, was prone to mental illness and at times thought he was made of glass. To make matters worse, his elder surviving son was also not a promising prospect. However, it was ultimately the old dynastic claim to the throne of France, first pursued by Edward III, that ultimately justified the war with France in English opinion. On the 12th of August 1415, Henry sailed for France, where his forces besieged the fortress at Harfleur, before capturing it on the 22nd of September. After this, he decided to march with his army across the French countryside towards Calais, despite the warnings of his council. During this march, on the 25th of October, in the plains near the village of Agincourt, a French army intercepted his route. Despite his men-at-arms being exhausted, outnumbered, and malnourished, Henry led his men into battle, decisively defeating the French, who suffered catastrophic losses. It is believed that the French men-at-arms were bogged down in the muddy battlefield, soaked from the previous night of heavy rain, and that this hindered the French advance, allowing them to be sitting ducks for the flanking English and Welsh archers. Most were simply hacked to death, while completely stuck in the deep mud, although it is believed a great many of them drowned in the mud as well. Nevertheless, this victory was seen as Henry's greatest, ranking alongside the Battle of Croquet and the Battle of Poitiers as the greatest English victories of the Hundred Years' War. Come the battle's end, some 6,000 French soldiers lay dead, with only a measly 400 English deaths in comparison. This bloodshed was not limited to the common soldier, as some might expect though. A staggering 90 to 120 great French lords were also killed during the battle, including three dukes, nine counts, one viscount, and even an archbishop. Entire noble families were wiped out in the male line due to the battle, and in some regions, an entire generation of landed nobility was annihilated. France also lost many of its high-ranking officers in this brutal battle. These catastrophic losses amongst the nobility may have been partially due to Henry's order that all French prisoners taken during the battle be put to death. Cambridge historian Brett Tingley posits that Henry was concerned that the prisoners 
might turn on their captors when the English were busy repelling a third wave of enemy troops, thus jeopardising a hard-fought victory as the battle was still raging at the time of this order. Regardless of this order, the victorious conclusion of Agincourt from the English viewpoint was only the first step in the campaign to recover the French possessions that he felt belonged to the English crown. Agincourt also held out the promise that Henry's pretensions to the French throne might be realised. After the battle, the English secured the command of the sea by driving the Genoese allies of the French out of the English Channel. This wouldn't be 100% effective, however, as while Henry was occupied with peace negotiations in 1416, a French and Genoese fleet surrounded the harbour at the English garrison Harfleur, captured early in the campaign and a French land force soon besieged the town with the, with the support of the navy. In March 1416, a raiding force of soldiers under the Earl of Dorset, Thomas Beaufort, the king's uncle, was attacked and only narrowly escaped defeat at the Battle of Valmont after a counter-attack by the garrison of Harfleur. To relieve the besieged town, Henry sent his brother, John, Duke of Bedford, to raise a fleet and set sail from Beachy Head on the 14th of August. The Franco-Genoese fleet was defeated the following day after the gruelling seven-hour Battle of the Seine. As a result of this victory, the besieged town was finally relieved. Henry's diplomatic efforts during this time would not be for naught, as he successfully managed to end Emperor Sigismund of the Holy Roman Empire's support for France. During this diplomatic mission, Henry also secured an alliance between England and the Holy Roman Empire with the signing of the Treaty of Canterbury in August 1416. With the Genoese, and now the Holy Roman Empire as well, out of the way, and after two years of patient preparation following the Battle of Agincourt, Henry renewed the war on a larger scale in 1417. After taking Cayenne, he quickly conquered Lower Normandy and Rouen was cut off from Paris and besieged. This siege would end up casting an even darker shadow on the reputation of the king, as along with his controversial, to say the least, order to slay French prisoners at Agincourt, Rouen, starving and unable to support the women and children of the town, forced them out through the gates, believing that Henry would allow them to pass through his army unmolested. Henry wouldn't allow this, however, and the expelled women and children died of starvation in the ditches surrounding the town. To make France's situation even worse around this time, they were plagued by internal conflicts which Henry skillfully used to his advantage without relaxing his warlike approach. In January 1419, Rouen finally fell to the English. Those Norman French who had resisted in the town for so long were severely punished. Elaine Blanchard, who had hanged English prisoners from the walls of Rouen previously, was summarily executed, and Robert de Livet, canon of Rouen, who had excommunicated the English king from the faith, was packed off to England and imprisoned for five years. With the momentum of this victory, come August, the English had reached the walls of Paris. During this time, France's internal struggles came to a head with the assassination of John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy, by Dauphine Charles's partisans on the 10th of September. The new Duke Philip the Good and the French court threw themselves into Henry's arms, and after six months of negotiation, the Treaty of Toy recognised Henry as the heir and regent of France. A couple years later, on the 2nd of June 1420, he married Catherine of Valois, the French king's daughter. They had only one son, yet another Henry, and this one would end up being the crazy one from my other video, who was born on the 6th of December 1421 at Windsor Castle. As there was still some resistance in France, from June to July 1420, King Henry's army besieged and took the military fortress called montereau Fautillon, close to Paris. From this, he then besieged and captured Melun in November 1420, before finally returning to England shortly thereafter. While Henry was back home in England, his brother Thomas, Duke of Clarence, led English forces in France. On the 22nd of March, 1421, Thomas led the English to a disastrous defeat at the Battle of Bourges against a Franco-Scottish army. The Duke and brother of the King was killed in the catastrophic battle. In retaliation to this, on the 10th of June, Henry sailed back to France to retrieve the situation. From July to August, Henry's forces besieged and captured Drew, thus relieving Allied forces at Chartres. On the 6th of October, his forces laid siege to Meaux, 
capturing it on the 11th of May 1422. Shortly following this siege, it is believed that Henry contracted dysentery. However, the symptoms of dysentery present themselves fairly quickly, and he seems to have been healthy in the weeks following the siege. At the time, alternative speculative causes of his illness included smallpox, the bacterial infection erysipelas, and even leprosy. Despite the unsure nature of what made him sick, there is no doubt that he had contracted a serious illness sometime between May and June. Recovering at the castle of Vincennes, by the end of June, it seemed he was well enough to lead his forces, with the intent of engaging the Dolphinist forces at cosnay sur loire At the outset, he would have been riding in full armour, probably in blistering heat, as the summer of 1422 is known to have been extremely hot. He was soon struck down again with a debilitating fever, possibly heat stroke due to the extreme weather, or a possible relapse of his previous illness. Whatever the cause or causes for this relapse, he would not recover from this final bout of illness. For a few short weeks, he was carried around in a litter, and his enemies having retreated, he decided to return to Paris. One story from this time has the gravely ill king attempting to mount his horse at Charenton one last time, but failing. He was taken back to Vincennes around the 10th of August, where he sadly died some weeks later. He was just 35 years old at the time of his death, and had reigned for 9 years. Shortly before his death, he named his surviving brother, John, Duke of Bedford, Regent of France, in the name of his son, Henry VI, who was only a few months old at the time. Sadly, the late King Henry did not live to be crowned King of France himself, as he might confidently have expected after the Treaty of Toy because Charles VI of France, to whom he had been named heir as a part of the treaty, survived him by just two months. Henry's comrade-in-arms, Lord Steward John Sutton, 1st Baron Dudley, brought Henry's body back to England and bore the royal standard at his funeral. The warrior king of England, Henry V, was ultimately buried in Westminster Abbey on the 7th of November, 1422. An exhumation in 1953, in which it appeared that he shared a grave with Richard Courtenay, led to speculation that Henry and Courtenay had been lovers. However, Courtenay's grave was found in the base of Henry's chantry, possibly disturbed when the king's memorial was built. Henry's last will and codelix, which gave specific instructions on how he should be buried, also made no mention of a co-burial with anyone else, making this line of thought unlikely. Well, I think that's where I'm going to end this video. That certainly was a long one, eh? As I said in one of my previous videos, I think what I'm going to do regarding upload schedule is guarantee at least one 15 to 20 minute video like this one comes out once a week, usually on Tuesday or Wednesday, with some smaller 5 to 8 minute videos possibly scattered throughout the week, depending on if I have time. Well, with that being said, as always, I hope you guys have a great day, night, wherever you are. And I hope to see you in the next one.